welcome to New Chips Online Demo Week. My name is Armando Vera Carvajal and I'm the Accelerator Director here at New Chip. We are so excited that you have decided to join us for this week long online event that welcomes hundreds of New Chip startups from around the world, alongside thousands of investors and entrepreneurs on this planet. Uh, we're launching today with a special keynote panel uh, with a very, very special group of incredible people to talk about the importance of impact investing today and far into the future. Uh, thus, it's my pleasure to welcome Chris Copham, Kendall Beckett, and Alex Gold from the Stanford Graduate School of Business Impact Fund. Uh, it's an evergreen fund that invests in early stage for-profit ventures seeking both financial and social and environmental returns, uh, which is also designed to expose Stanford students to the process of impact investing. Uh, this particular fund is managed by students with oversight from uh, professors Paul Fleiderter and Ken Singleton under the guidance of the Center for Social Innovation. Uh, additional faculty, alumni, and expert practitioners provide also strategic guidance on co-investing, sourcing, deal structuring, uh, impact measurement, portfolio allocation, and of course, exits. Uh, Chris, Kendall, Alex, thank you so much for joining us today. It's such a pleasure to have you on this panel. Uh, I imagine you're all super, super busy uh, at Stanford in your MBAs and with this fund. So it's such a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, to kick off this conversation, I would love it if you could tell us a little bit more about you know, the Stanford GSB Impact Fund. You know, what is its mission and why have each of you chosen to make this a part of your MBA experience? Chris, why don't we go with you first? Thanks, Armando. Appreciate the introduction and thanks for making the time to have us here today. So you now I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what the Impact Fund is and why we're all doing it. So the Impact Fund started, you know, before any of us got to the GSB about uh, six years ago. And the idea, as I've heard from some of our uh, from, from our faculty advisors, is sort of analogous to the concept of a teaching hospital to give MBA students the opportunity to kind of practice impact investing and understand both how you think about a how you think about this from the perspective of a venture investor, but also how you think about the kind of theory of change and how to analyze and measure impact in for-profit ventures. Um, so we sit within the Center for Social the Center for Social Innovation of the Stanford GSB. Uh, the entire investment team is made up of first-year MBA candidates, with a couple of folks from our MSX program as well. Um, MBA two is leading the teams and then our um, faculty and practitioner um, advisors who kind of oversee the whole thing. Uh, the capital we invest comes from, uh, pro comes from anonymous alumni donations and all of the returns you generate are reinvested into our portfolio or new enterprises. So, you know, the idea isn't to, you know, find the next unicorn and make a bunch of people really rich, but really just to be able to, you know, support these founders, support these businesses and provide this opportunity for, for learning among the students. Uh, so we're all here from the financial technology team of the fund, but we have seven sector teams in total. So we have an education team. We have a team that focuses on energy and the environment. We have a team that focuses on food and agriculture space, healthcare, justice, and urban development. In terms of the way that we invest, we try to target about 1% uh, or more of the given round. But there's, of course, flexibility depending on the company and the terms presented to us. It's going to end up being, you know, in the five-figure neighborhood, twenty-five to seventy-five thousand dollars, and we'll do anything from the angel stage up to Series A at the latest. The one thing that we do always kind of stick to, though, is that we don't come in as a lead investor. We will take on the terms that other investors have already agreed upon, leverage the due diligence that others are already performing, and jump off from there to uh, to run our investment process. So that's uh, kind of the way that we, we approach this. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'd be very interested if you could tell us a little bit more about, you know, your background, um, you know, prior to Stanford, you know, what brought you here and, and why are you making this a part of your experience? Yeah, so I'll go first and then we'll pass it along to Kendall and Alex. Uh, but for, for me personally, this kind of comes out of my pre-Stanford career. So after I graduated from uh, UT uh, five years ago, hook em horns, um, I moved into a banking career on Wall Street, uh, working at J.P. Morgan, focusing on financial services and fintech. Uh, most of the time I was there, I was focused, you know, on your traditional for-profit 
uh, you know, wealth maximizing sort of financial services businesses. But in my final months in my role before I headed off to business school, I was kind of pulled into a task force that our firm had put together to address the racial wealth gap in the United States uh, in the wake of George Floyd's death. Uh, we had come to the conclusion that a big source of why George Floyd ended up in the position that he was in is because of these persistent inequities in access to financial services and capital which have left certain groups of people left out of the financial system that those of us who are privileged enough to have been plugged into it take for granted. That really is what woke me up to the scale of the financial inclusion problem as it exists today, but also kind of the potential for private business to be part of the solution. So coming into Stanford, one of my main goals is to be able to take what I learned working on the problem at JP Morgan and build on that by being able to work directly with young startups, trying to change things from the ground up. That's incredible and very meaningful uh, for you to pursue that path. Kendall, what about you? Yeah, so I um, I don't have a financial services or, or investing background, but I, but I worked in big tech prior to, to coming to the GSB. Um, so I'm really passionate about how technology can be used for good. Uh, and I'm also interested in financial inclusion and opportunity. I worked in affordable housing for a number of years prior to, to entering big tech. And that's a space where financing and payments and savings play such a huge role in where people can, um, what, what opportunities people can access and, and where they live and, uh, and therefore where they can work. Um, so, so for me, combining those two things, I think FinTech's an area that's really ripe for innovation and harnessing the power of tech for good right now in a conversation that's much more nuanced around the pros and cons of tech. Uh, and, and for me, the Impact Fund was a really unique opportunity to roll up our sleeves and be practitioners and, and talk directly to founders and, and have capital to be able to play with um, while being in business school and in an academic environment. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kendall. Alex? Yeah, I, I mean, I think similar to everything that Chris and Kendall said in terms of like wanting to get the real world experience. And so I had come from an investing background, uh, more so on the private equity side. Um, and through that, I kind of developed this passion for ultimately partnering with and supporting founders. Um, so, you know, in, in my prior experience, um, where I was actually investing in financial services and fintech companies, we were always working with entrepreneurs for sort of looking for that next stage of growth for their business. But I always kind of had this struggle with, um, you know, the idea of measuring success only on financial terms. Um, and I kind of believe that financial performance and positive social change are inherently connected. And I think the impact fund is a really exciting opportunity for us to uh, really just carefully balance both financial impact and, and impact related criteria um, when making investment decisions. So for me, it was really this you know, eagerness to be able to back mission driven founders who want to make a difference through innovation, particularly as companies are sort of increasingly expected to both deliver strong financial performance and respond to meaningful sort of societal changes or challenges. That's incredible. And what I love is that you know, the three of you, as I'm, I imagine everybody else at the fund has that clear mission, right? Uh, the impact fund is also on that mission to lower the barriers and provide systemic access to, as Chris was saying, previously excluded unbanked, underbanked populations into the financial system. I'd love to get your thoughts on why this matters now more than ever. Uh, and perhaps what does the future hold as funds such as yours start to take more of an influence? Chris. Well, I think this has always been a very important piece of the puzzle, but I think now you have just more awareness and more appreciation for the role that this plays in generating more equitable opportunities and outcomes for people within the US and, and around the world. Now, as I had alluded to with, you know, kind of uh, the first thing that I was talking about, within the US, financial inequality continues to contribute to this wealth gap between, uh, you know, people of color and, uh, and the rest of the population here in this country. And that has implications for people's access to education, access to healthcare, and their ability to be able to kind of have the same, have, have sort, sort of the same life opportunities that everybody would like to have. We see that playing out even through the pandemic right now, where something as basic as getting a, getting a stimulus check into people's hands becomes more, dif more difficult when you don't have a bank account or 
if you're having to keep money in an informal financial institution versus uh, you know being able to park it up at a place like a, like a Chase or a, or a bank like that. And I think, you know, for us, we're really excited that we see entrepreneurs being able to, you know, push along areas such as alternative credit data. So find ways to underwrite things people are already doing that aren't picked up by credit underwriting systems as they exist today or savings vehicles that can help people be able to grow their wealth or, uh, you know, the back end infrastructure that, you know, within the U.S. and outside of this country can help bring more people into the system by getting that data together and allowing financial institutions to serve them. Kendall, what are your thoughts? Well, I certainly agree with that. I think Chris put it really well. I, I'll just add that I think COVID is obviously a huge player here. And I think it, it's exacer exacerbated a lot of structural inequities that were already sort of below the surface. Um, and particularly, I think, in terms of, of savings and access. So unemployment has disproportionately hit communities of color. And those working in informal sectors are paycheck to paycheck. And, and that lack of access and lack of ability to draw on savings have, has become even more important in the ramifications for different communities. Um, so I think access to financial products is so fundamental. Um, and it's key to building savings. And ultimately, I think, moving towards individual wealth creation um, then, and then generational wealth creation. That is so key in this country in particular when you think about, uh, you know, really closing the wealth gap um, even more than the income gap. Um, so a future that I'm excited about is one where I think finance is a lot more personalized. It feels like there's this structure that doesn't fit the reality of, um, of salaries and income generation and, and wealth for a vast majority of people. Um, so whether it's through rent schedules or mortgage payments or um, you know, really more savvy approaches to, to risk pricing and interest rates. I think there's there's a lot of opportunity for fintech to, to play a role here. I think you're getting, um, Alex, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that Kendall and Chris have said. Um, and I think even with all the innovation that we've seen in financial services, particularly, there's still all these other communities that are still being excluded and don't have the right tools to build long-term sustainable savings, or quite frankly, are wary of what we, I guess we would consider traditional financial services. And so over time, people have essentially lost their trust in financial products. And I think we think right now there's this massive opportunity sort of with the new technological innovations that make sort of launching financial products that much easier um, and really sort of rebuilding with a new sort of customer focus that you know, hopefully over time, we'll be able to rebuild that trust in financial products and get more people into the system. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think especially as some of the regulatory components and organs also begin to shift with the new administration, a lot of change coming in that regard. Um, I understand that you know the three of you represent the FinTech team at the Impact Fund, uh, but beyond finance, what are some of the other systemic challenges and constraints that populations and also entrepreneurs face, perhaps in ed tech, clean energy, the healthcare sectors. So you know, I actually talked to a classmate about this fairly recently who's interested in building an enterprise within the healthcare space. And one of the things that he brought up to me was the fragmentation of the healthcare system. And we see a lot of this here in the US, but even in, even in other countries where for example, in the UK, you have this national healthcare system, but the hospitals individually are able to sort of do their own thing within that. And being able to modernize medical records within that turned out to be an almost impossible task. And, you know, you, you turn back to our system here and it took, you know, decades for electronic, electronic medical records to catch on. And even now you don't really have a single system everybody operates with them. So sharing information and being able to ensure continuity of care is something that, you know, people are still struggling with. And if you're trying to build a business in that space, it's something that you're going to have to reckon with. Yeah. The, the fragmentation's definitely a big elephant in the room. Um, Kendall, I'm interested in getting your perspective also on the, the housing space. You mentioned earlier that you have previous perspective and with COVID-19, you know, I've seen some recent statistics about homelessness, access to housing, rents, you know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, as Alex and Chris know, it's a, it's a place that I'm really excited about. Uh, and I think there's a lot 
um, going on. I mean, one very basic point here is the fact that rental payments are included in credit scores. And so when you think about the number of people that are renters in this country that aren't building credit uh, and, and at the same time not building wealth, if they were, if they were homeowners, uh, that's just a huge missed opportunity. So, uh, so one point here is that there's a number of really interesting companies in the space that are, uh, that are trying to think about ways that rental payments can both incentivize uh, more on-time payments if you put credit scores in front of people to say this is a way that you can start building something that you haven't had, um, and, and to think more deeply about what, what do rental payment schedules look like? Why do we have to pay rent at the first of the month? Is there a better way and a more informed way um, to think about rent? Uh, in a way that matches people's um, income, you know, timelines and schedules. So there's a lot of really interesting space in a place that I think is really or structurally broken. Uh, and uh, and I, I'm sure <laughs> we'll, we'll be able to talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. Alex, uh, any perspective on some of the other systemic challenges? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we've spent a little bit of time researching sort of education finance. Um, and I think the issue that we found is that there's an increased focus in sort of spending versus education outcome, um, as well as just sort of like in terms of financial accessibility to quality education. I think the example or the sort of data points that we've always kind of honed in on or and some of our colleagues on the ed tech team have as well is that the US school districts receive a massive sort of influx of taxpayer funds, right? So this is a $600 billion market, but there's kind of this consistent lack of knowledge of the ROI of how those dollars are actually spent. Um, and so school administrators are general, they're generally lacking this sort of strong financial planning tools. And quite frankly, like they're not experts in budgeting um, because that's not, that's not what their training is. So there's been a lot of discussion around how can you better equip administrators with the systems, the frameworks, the right tools that ultimately enable better understanding, under understanding of academic ROI um, of sort of spend at the district and school level. And so the actual application of that is school sort of financial management systems, uh, student debt management, college financing tools, ISAs, um, and all these sort of other components that can sort of come out of that and ultimately hopefully open up some more access to education. I agree. Um, and at tech's a very, uh, we have a lot of exposure to at tech here at New Chip, work with so many companies that are trying to, uh, you know, find innovation, uh, help administrators and decision makers at the top make better decisions. Because as you mentioned, it's a huge market and there's a very steady inflow of, uh, capital from the government to, to drive this. So it would be very interesting to see how much more innovation comes out, especially as a result of the pandemic with a lot of the structural constraints that have been imposed on, on decision makers in that sector. Um, I wanted to take a, a step back sort of to, to more of the, the financial side of the focus of the impact fund. Uh, you guys are also trying to seek to address the liquidity challenges and the credit access issues uh, that keep people in pretty precarious financial positions. Um, Chris was talking about the George Floyd situation, right? And some of the profound impacts and the ripple effects and also what it says about the society in which we live. These are, you know, oftentimes the results of cycles that perpetuate poverty, right? Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about why these issues matter so much to the fund, why you're focused on supporting entrepreneurs who, who are seeking to change that paradigm. Yeah, so I think if you look at the financial inclusion challenge broadly and then take it down to the level of the individual person, one of the first things you run into as, you know, a lower income person or somebody who is less plugged into the system is that struggle to get past that bare minimum paycheck to paycheck financial position where every dollar that comes in then immediately goes out to cover an essential expense and you're left with zero or maybe less than zero and you're having to take on a payday loan or something of that nature to try to bridge the gap so that you can keep your apartment, keep your car so you can get to work and be able to kind of stitch your life together. And, you know, because you are reliant on that short term liquidity and because you don't have the credit profile and the banking relationships to be able to able to get a more reasonably priced loan product, you're taking on this payday loan, which runs at, you know, 300 plus percent APR, that's eating into your ability to hold on to any of your money, but you really don't have a choice. You, you 
you're in a position where you really can't find anybody else to lend to you. And, you know, working to make ends meet and balance that, you probably don't even have the energy to go out and look for it, even if, you know, even if you knew where to look. And then if you, you know, you turn over to look at uh, developing countries, uh, you know, you find that a lot of people are simply unable to access any sort of traditional financial product at all because, you know, they're in a cash economy, they're kind of off, they're off the digital grid. They're essentially invisible to their country's banks, even to their own governments a lot of the time. And they're really, they really are left with nothing to to protect against short-term shocks. If you have, you know, let's say if you're growing and selling crops in a village in Africa, if you have some sort of shock that causes your crops to be destroyed, or if, you know, you're not able to sell them that week, you don't really have any way to, to bounce back from that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the ramifications that are, that, that are profound and uh, you, get, you had me thinking a lot about the, uh, the payday loan business. I mean, uh, it's, uh, we've had startups here in the accelerator that have tried to focus on transforming and disrupting that space. There was a statistic about a year ago where one of the founders in our accelerator focused on disrupting payday loans he said there are more payday loan centers and there are McDonald's locations in the U.S. And the, the interest rates that they charge are almost criminal, right? We also had a, a regulator from the Consumer Protection Bureau here at a previous demo week talking about sort of the protections and also the, the impact, the effect that can societally result in, in our country from people getting into those sort of situations with debt they simply could never afford in the first place. Um, Kendall, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, again, I think Chris put it very well. I would just add that it just goes back to the point that these structures don't fit the way that people generate generate income and spend and save. And I think there's a naive answer, which is that people should be able to, regardless of how, um, you, know, you know, what their unemployment looks like um, and, and how their income is generated, they should be able to anticipate and save over time. But that's not the reality for people that are living paycheck to paycheck and, and certainly doesn't allow for unanticipated financial shocks. Um, so if something comes up, you know, car repair or a medical bill, um, you know, to your point, your option is something predatory like a, like a payday loan um, or something worse like, like eviction. Uh, and so um, I just think that this, this system and this lack of access to, to liquidity and, and to be able to weather shocks when they come up for everyone um, is, is so fundamentally broken. And it's one of the reasons why I'm really excited by companies that are seeking to change the way that people pay down expenses and debt uh, and access more affordable emergency you know, loans and lines of credit. And you know, to your point, I think it'd be very interesting, Alex, if you have any examples of a you know, company in your portfolio that you believe is promising in this regard or companies that you've been looking at that could play a big role in disrupting this landscape. Yeah, and I mean, Chris, Kendall, and I have, have spoken just a lot about this exact issue, um, right, in the sense that there's these predatory financial products, and you have to sort of ease people back into this financial system, um, whether it's real-time wages, starter credit cards, or just other sort of credit-building products. And, and so one company that we actually partnered with um, a couple of years ago is this company called Atlas. And so the way that we thought about the problem was there's a sort of lack of uniformity across program enrollment and reimbursement processes for healthcare aid programs. And so what this does is it actually makes it very difficult for patients to access and afford care. And so the solution is you can actually use technology to find matches between patients and funders, and that's what Atlas does. So they will essentially help patients access care and avoid debt. And then it, on the other hand, it obviously, for the hospitals, helps them get paid. And so Atlas has this sort of what I guess they would call a navigator that essentially pro providers and life science or, um, organizations um, help and, and it really just helps them administer reimbursement programs uh, to help patients access and sort of afford healthcare. So it's this really interesting solution of trying to close this healthcare funding gap. Um, and we haven't really seen a lot of other solutions on the market that do that. And especially given sort of COVID. Um, they've definitely seen an uptick in hospitals reaching out to them. They've been expanding their philanthropic programs, which now support essential services at hospitals, such as cancer treatment. So this is a company that we're really excited about. Um, and we think that they have a lot of room to grow. I love it. I love it. Um, and on, on a similar sort of vein, um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about 
the pandemic and the impacts that it's had. Um, obviously, the past year has created a pretty devastating reality for an overwhelming number of people in this country and, and worldwide. Um, it's dealt huge blows to the livelihood and financial stability of hundreds of millions of people. How, you know, how's the impact fund at Stanford thinking about developing and widening avenues for these underserved populations so that they can build back up? Um, and are there perhaps any examples of startups that you have seen emerge as a result of these very recent challenges, a company that was born out of the COVID-19 pandemic? Chris. I mean, as I think about it, a lot of the companies that we, we were looking at, you know, predate the COVID-19 pandemic because it really has exacerbated problems that already existed and just kind of accentuated where the weak points in people's personal financial situations were. That said, we've seen a, a couple that I think would be particularly useful to folks who have been impacted by the pandemic. Like there was one, for example, called Till that focused on trying to break the eviction cycle by essentially allowing people to have, they would, they would pay a sort of, I guess, a sort of subscription fee to Till. And in exchange, Till could, Till could sort of bridge the gap in the event that there was a shortfall in their income and they fell behind on rent, Till could keep them in their apartment and avoid the more severe disruption that, uh, that would come with getting evicted, having to relocate, potentially now facing job loss because you don't have a permanent home and potentially winding up in trouble with the law if you're having to sleep on your sleep in your car or on the street. So kind of, you know, if, you're, if, you, if you can head off being evicted, you head off, a, you know, kind of a cascade of follow on events that can put a person to a point where they really can't recover from. Another one we were looking at that uh, we were actually introduced to by new chip uh, was Carrotfy. Uh, this, this, so this one is kind of a similar goal, but on the homeowner side, you know, proactively preventing foreclosures by flagging folks who are in financial distress and helping them work with their mortgage servicers and lenders to be able to shore up their financial situations and get to a stable position. Because it's really, it's not good for, it's not good for the investor who holds the mortgage and it's really not good for the person who's living in the home. Everybody loses if you get to a foreclosure. And if you look back to the financial crisis, that burden always fell most severely on the lower income homeowners, the people who were, I guess, the beneficiaries, but also the victims of the subprime loan wave that you had in the run up to 2008. If you come out of that, the people who were higher up on the chain, living in more expensive homes, they were able to bounce back, their home values recovered, and they're kind of doing fine now. But the people who were most caught up in subprime, many of whom were people of color, still have not recovered the lost wealth from that, from that last crisis. So that ends up being a very important area to focus on. Yeah, I mean, the, the Great Recession, right? And I think for many, it still hasn't hit that it was the Great Recession and that it's had profound ripple effects on so many lives here. Um, I'm very familiar with CaritFi. Um, the companies that you're supporting, are they primarily focused on the US market or are you also looking at startups that are global in scope or perhaps abroad? So we, we do have, we, we, we have a, a, global, a global mandate. We, I guess just by virtue of being a US school with a little bit of overrepresentation on the American side tend to run into a lot of American companies. But we've talked to founders from really all from really all over the world, within the States, within Latin America. Uh, we're talking to a couple of companies whose founders are based out of Africa. And really, we're looking to try to solve the financial inclusion challenge wherever we can, wherever we can wrap our minds around it and understand it, and wherever folks are working to combat it. Gotcha. That, I mean, it makes perfect sense in this current global environment. Kendall, do you have any thoughts that you want to add? Well, I just add on the global mandate piece to start that I think one thing that was important for our team was to um, make sure that we had people that had expertise in the markets uh, that we were looking at companies. So, you know, we uh, the three of us are um, a small subset of the, the fintech team. There's about seven of us total. Um, and some of our colleagues have more experience working in East Africa or, uh, or in Latin America, where I think a lot of interesting fintech companies are coming from, but wanting to understand exactly 
you know, firsthand what uh, what are these market needs, how they might be similar or different from the U.S. And so that has driven sort of how we've divided and conquered um, amongst our team this year. Um, I think that the examples that that Chris gave are spot on are the companies that we're, we're excited about. Um, I would just add that one thing that has been really striking to me is that uh, these companies have experienced really exponential growth in a lot of instances this year because of COVID uh, and in terms of the people that they serve or the partnerships they've been able to, to make. Uh, and so I think it just underscores that this, um, you know, this model of, of serving low income um, people or people that have been priced out can work uh, and it can work in, uh, in, in a crisis that shows how, how needed these products are. I, I think we've seen definitely seen like through all of our sort of sourcing efforts, a lot of development on the sort of credit building side. And I think what it really comes down to is a lot of companies are trying to figure out like what is this sort of atomic unit that is going to enable people to sort of build sustainable savings and sort of break this cycle of poverty. And what is going to be that thing that ultimately gives people more access to um, other financial services? So whether it is here in the US and we've seen a couple other companies like whether it's Grow Credit or Tomo Credit, um, there's a company up in Canada called Borrowwell. There's definitely been a lot on that sort of how do you start to ease people into that financial system and sort of how do you sort of start to give them, quite frankly, guide rails around certain types of credit usage. Um, because the last thing that we obviously want to happen in terms of building sustainable savings and breaking this poverty cycle is you then start to give people too, too much of a leash and they don't know how to use it. So. We've definitely spent a lot of time focusing there. That, that's great to hear and encouraging. Um, I think for all of the people in the audience, investors alike, uh, it's so good to know that we, there is a fund, uh, among others, that cares about these specific aspects of life and innovation with startups. I'd like to shift a little bit um, more towards the, the entrepreneurial side of things. Um, obviously, you're, you know, you're at Stanford, some of you have had previous careers in finance. Now you're in a position where you're working and having a lot of face time with early stage entrepreneurs. From your perspective, uh, what do you think is one of the most common mistakes that early stage entrepreneurs make today? Chris. So I think for, from the perspective of an investor like us who is looking both for impact and a you know, successful you know, business model, what I what I've found is that you tend to have folks who are really good at one or the other, but being able to balance both ends up being ends up being more of a challenge. And I think it goes, you know, back to sort of this pre-existing paradigm that you can either make money or you can help people, but you can't do both at the same time. And I think that's that's empirically not true. You just have to be a little bit more thoughtful around you know, how you price a product, how you structure it, sort of protections you put in place to make sure that you're that you're not taking advantage of your customers, that you're that you're helping them. And I think being able to master that balancing act is something that you know people can still continue to work at trying to figure out. And I you know I think that being able to do that is going it's going to make you have to build a more robust business model that is more resilient. And it's also going to set you up to be able to kind of you know, kind of, kind of avoid running into some of, you know, the ethical and moral moral quandaries that we've seen some of the big Silicon Valley tech companies run into as they've hit scale and matured. And now you have, you know, Facebook and Google and Amazon having to grapple with moral and legal issues that, you know, nobody really considered when you're in the stage of let's move fast and break things. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's so true. And oftentimes, in the name of innovation, we have to suspend our belief in those until that time comes down the road, but important that we're countering them. Kendall, what are your thoughts? Um, for me, I think it would be uh, not focusing or at least articulating how your idea can be differentiated in the long term. Um, I think this is probably especially true in fintech and talking to some of our you know, counterparts in clean energy or, or health, places where there are things like patents and, and it's much more about a physical product that can be, uh, that can be invented and, and create it, this, you know, this market that's a little hard to copy. Um, but for FinTech, I think the question that uh, our advisors have 
uh, really pushed us to, to ask. And, and we have noticed um, amongst the entrepreneurs that we've talked to is what's, what stops someone that's more large and established in this space from copying what you're doing uh, once you prove the concept. Uh, and I think that's a place where, uh, you know, you know, the financial industry in general and fintech, it, it, it tends towards consolidation. And so once you prove that this is a market that can be served, how do you continue to do it in the long term and in a way that's differentiated from some bigger players? Yeah, it's a good, we, we see that a lot. Also in the accelerator, we ask that question quite often. Oftentimes the answer we get is, well, we'll just get acquired, right? <laughs> They'll just uh, fold us into their portfolio. That's the end. Uh, but sometimes <laughs> that's not, it's not a viable uh, strategy for, for everybody. Alex, what are your thoughts? The most common mistake uh, that entrepreneurs make at the early stage? Yeah, and and I know I know they said yes for one. I think I actually have two that I'd like to mention. I think the first is really just help us understand um, your problem, the problem, and how you solve it. So being super clear about what you are focusing on and what you're solving, and I think that then ultimately, if you're clear on that as an as an early stage entrepreneur, it makes it so much easier for a venture capitalist to actually then go and sort of really understand exactly what's going on. We see a lot of really exciting companies, really bright founders, but we want to understand the exact problem that you're trying to solve and why you think your solution is capable of sort of really filling this acute need. And then I think the second thing is sometimes we see early early entrepreneurs sort of lacking focus. And I think for me, this comes back to nail the product and the sort of product market fit and then scale it from there. Um, and it's not a bad thing to sort of build a diversified business or have those aspirations. And that's what we love. And that's what gets us so excited. But I think it's really important to make sure that your solution is actually addressing the need first before you expand. I love it. And I think it, it hits on something we hit a lot on here at Egypt. Focus on the problem, right? Obsess on the problem you're trying to solve. Um, I was giving a talk the other day at UT McCombs for some of the students there. And phenomenal, amazing, incredible startup ideas, but I'm asking them, well, what is the problem you're trying to solve, right? And how can you make money in the long term? All the like eyes and their, their looks, they were like, wow, I hadn't thought about that. And I think it's something we see a lot with early stage founders, not thinking too much about that product market fit, let alone the problem they're trying to solve. I wanted to go to this other question, um, putting aside the fundamental criteria and mandates of a VC fund, you know, there are typically requirements you have to look for some funds only invest in this or that. What do you ultimately look for when you're making a final investment decision in a given founder or a startup? Chris. Well, I think when it comes to looking at the founder, one of the things that we want to look for is a sense of self-awareness and an appreciation for their own weaknesses and a desire to try to overcome and, and grow over those. Um, you know, like part of part of our investment framework, beyond just finding a good business that has the product market fit, that has the economics, that has the potential to grow, is that this is being led by somebody who is who is self aware and who is ready and prepared to pivot when inevitably they face a challenge that requires them to kind of be flexible and and be adaptable. So. I, I think that we need to, as we're, as we're sourcing, we try to assess whether the founders that we're speaking to, you know, have an appreciation for those blind spots and are open to the idea that, you know, maybe they have a great idea that they're on the right track, but that there are still unknown unknowns that they're going to surface as they move along that track. Yeah. Yeah. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Kendall, what about you? What is that sort of, uh, deal or no deal that you for in founders? Um, yeah, well, I think uh, I, I think Chris have covered the founder point pretty well, but I think that the in terms of the company um, and the idea, what I would say is that we're we're an impact first fund, which means that we're looking for exponential impact subject to at least a satisfactory return, uh, and and so we prioritize that. So so a founder, you know, I think can talk really qualitatively and theoretically about uh, the impact thesis sometimes, but actually having a measurement strategy or a set of numbers in place that can start to quantify 
impact and uh, and communicate that to to our investment committee is really key. And I think within impact, you know, it's not just here's what the average consumer um, benefits uh, from this product, but who who is the customer profile and why have they been historically left out of this system or why are they a new type of consumer that hasn't been served in the past? Um, you know, are they uh, are they largely um, you know, people of color, are they, uh, you know, I think it's something that we prioritize at the end of the day the most, being able to have a really clear impact thesis that matches um, what we set out to, to look for at the beginning of this experience. Yeah, measuring that impact. I think that's also one of the toughest things for companies that are trying to be involved in that specific social space. Alex, what are your thoughts also on the, the criteria you would look for? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Kendall's point on measuring impact. I think it's so hard to to do that. And I think that's where we see a lot of companies ultimately struggle. Um, I think the one other aspect that I would have is really help put us in the shoes of the customer. And it's important that the team really understands the community and the end users. And um, I think that's sometimes just really hard to do. And especially a lot of the VCs that, that you know entrepreneurs will be pitching to, like we are not going to understand the consumer as much as we say that we will. And we say that we, that we, that we understand it. We will have never lived it. Um, and I think that's what, why it's so important for, to help put us in that position and help us really understand why is this a problem and why does this need to be addressed? Yeah. Yeah. Going back to that problem piece, I think also asking it and framing it in terms of why it's super important. Um, I'd love to, you know, we're, we're nearing the end of this talk, which has been super insightful and just incredible for us here. In the current context of our world today, you know, what actionable advice would you give to entrepreneurs who are trying to build or want to build impact driven startups and want to make the world a better place? Chris. So my take is like, don't be afraid to roll up your sleeves, get your hands dirty, and get out there and immerse yourself in the community you're trying to serve firsthand. Um, this, this especially becomes important as we're thinking about uh, startups that are focused on the African continent. And many times you see a leadership team and an advisory board that is largely white Americans who might have only a peripheral connection to that community. And I think there is immense value to you know, one, being able to immerse yourself in that community. But if you don't have that experience firsthand, bring somebody onto your team who is of that community, understands it intimately, and knows the nuances, the ins and outs of trying to build a business that caters to that. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we can talk all, all we want about how to build solutions from, you know, Silicon Valley, from Austin, from places like Stanford. But at the end of the day, we're only going to have this outside perspective and it's going to be skewed by our own bubbles that we live within. And you know, regardless of whether you're a VC or an, or an entrepreneur, or if you're working for a larger company, you your worldview is shaped by the folks who surround you. So you have to mix that up if you want to be able to understand what solutions are really needed. I love that. And I think just bringing in the right people to the team, all the way from advisors to directors to, to your first hires, co-founders, et cetera, makes a very big impact on the strategic direction of, of that startup. Really good feedback. Kendall, what is your, your advice? Um, I would say to really think critically about what control you want to have over the enterprise that you're building um, and, and what that means for your financing strategy. I think uh, there's a lot of, uh, especially in social enterprises and, and um, impact conscious and impact, you know, uh, focus companies, it's, it's a real trade off because if you bring investors on that don't have the same focus on serving the communities that you want to in the way that you think is going to make a difference, that's, going to cause real problems in the long run. And, uh, and it's this really delicate battle of being, a, you know, a for profit model, but wanting to have um, an impact at the same time. But I think that when you think about equity, and you think about the control structures that you want to have in place, uh, you don't you don't want to be in a position where you feel like something that you really care about is going in a direction that you don't believe in down the line. I couldn't agree more. And I think we've seen it in, in different 
flavors here in Egypt where you have founders who are pursuing this vision, this dream about making an impact in a given market or industry, uh, but they happen to have the wrong investors or partners on their cap table. And that takes them in a 180. So I think having the right partners to back you is super important as well. Uh, Alex, what advice would you like to give entrepreneurs? Yeah, I think my real piece of advice is don't be afraid to question why current processes exist. Um, I think the reality is you'll be pretty surprised to find out that there really isn't a good reason. Um, or maybe it was handicapped at the sort of technological constraints, you know, 20, 30 years ago. But this is the opportunity. Um, there's a tremendous amount. And to, I mean, I guess to really take a financial services approach to it, there's just a tremendous amount of innovation going on at the moment. And financial services were not designed with everyone in mind, but now they can be. So don't be afraid to sort of keep asking why and try to understand, was this designed for a specific reason? Or was this designed because of a specific constraint? I love that. The no complacency, no conformity, always question why. I, I think that's a, at the root cause of a lot of the big innovation that we've seen and that we will see, I think, over the coming decades. Hopefully, uh, with your fund being a catalyst of that change. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, Kendall, Alex. This has been such a great conversation. I'm pretty sure everyone in the audience, investors, entrepreneurs, students, thought leaders who are listening to this right now have gained a lot of insight from your individual perspectives, but also from what you're doing at your fund. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope to have you here again sometime in the future. Likewise, Armando. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much.